Pandemic-related lockdowns and closures were hard on everyone. But a growing body of research suggests what many parents may already suspect. They were especially hard on young people. Now a new study scanning adolescent brains seems to be backing some of those suspicions. The report was presented at the annual meeting of the Society for Neuroscience this week, and the research was led by Patricia Kuhl. She's co-director of the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. Professor Kuhl, when you looked at those scans, what did they reveal? What did you see? What we saw in the brains of teenagers aged 9 to 19 was that the measures indicate that their brains are aging faster than is typical in the teenage years. So it's as though the pandemic lockdown caused these kids to more rapidly change in the measures. We're measuring cortical thickness. That's the thickness of the gray matter uh, right at the top of your skull. So you can see that thinning. Yes, yes. I mean, it normally thins with age, but the thinning is way beyond what you would expect uh, on that normative uh, developmental pathway. Mm -hmm. And the, the effect is huge in females, much larger in females than in males. They all show it, males and females, but females are showing it much more strongly. Why do you think that is? Well, it's not clear yet, but we will find out. It is Mm -hmm. discoverable. We have all these measures on the teens. We have their social media use. We have their cognitive abilities tested. We have their sense of well-being. We've done many survey measures to see what they report with regard to their sense of well-being. And if we can link the thinning, particularly in females, to the um, survey results that they give us saying that they're more feeling isolated and more depressed because of the pandemic, then we could draw a link between this rapid aging and stress. Were there other indicators uh, apart from the thinning in those scans themselves? Well, we have hundreds, Mm -hmm. literally, of measures. And this is the first one. And it was so surprising and so dramatic uh, that we we felt we needed to come out with this one to begin with before we can reveal all the rest. But yes. And uh, what's another interesting fact about the data, when you look at the 68 brain areas that we examine, what we see in the female brains is that everything is affected, both hemispheres, whereas in the boys, we only see effects in the occipital uh, cortex, which is responsible for vision. And so with these dramatic differences between the magnitude of the effect, plus it's in specific areas of the male brain. What do you think the consequences could be of this kind of thinning? Well, so I think the the million, multi-million dollar question actually to answer it is what happens next? Is this a permanent shift? So in addition to all the measures I described, we have additional ones where the kids were in a functional brain scanner called magnetoencephalography, and they were trying to learn uh, an artificial grammar, you know, a, a string of letters with words and uh, that kind of resemble words, but they're not words. And we were trying to see how rapidly does the teenage brain learn. So we have the opportunity to see whether the kids who thin the most had most difficulty learning new material. That would be bad news. You know, if if we've affected plasticity, that would be bad news. So we need to find that out. But we might see if there's recovery as their social lives improve, mm-hmm. if that's the root cause. Maybe they'd thin more slowly, you know, and sort of catch up to what's typical if they thinned more slowly. Wanting to release this at this stage while your work is still continuing, you mentioned that was important to you. Why is that? What message did you hope that the folks at the conference well, and, and our listeners yeah, take away? The, The larger message is that our teens are stressed. Our teens are having difficulties. It it was heading that way. The the demographic data say that our teens were reporting depression and a sense of despair prior to the pandemic. The pandemic exacerbated it as teens only interacted, at least in the United States. They were on screens to learn, 
to connect with their friends, to have any life at all. They were on screens. And I know from other studies that, that, that kids don't learn from screens. There's learning loss all over the place in the primary and secondary school years uh, in math and reading because the kids were trying to learn on screens. Kids need people, and teenagers particularly, need their social connections to feel good. Your, your research specifically, you know, looked at, at the lockdown, pandemic lockdown period. So based on right. what you've seen, uh, you know, is your sense that, that teenagers should have been, been out of that lockdown situation or allowed back in their social circles sooner? You know, th that is just a great question. And, you know, what are you going to do? You're between the rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. You've got a pandemic, especially before there were vaccines, that is so deadly and the, you know, we're now seeing the effects on the brain of long COVID. Now, I'm not measuring, this isn't long COVID. This is the effect of the lockdown. But long COVID is, is bad. So protecting our kids by closing things down, I think, was the right thing to do. When should we have opened up? Should we have insisted on masking? Was masking sufficient? I think it's anybody's guess what the perfect thing to do would have, would have been. Uh, are you worried that... that those who disagree with lockdowns entirely uh, might use your research, despite what you just said very clearly, might pick and choose from 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 what you've said here or what the research shows so far um, to, to try to um, subvert the calls right. for lockdowns. Well, I would hate for that to happen, but that's the problem. I mean, you present your research and you put it out there as veridically, as honestly as you can, and people twist things. I, I don't think anybody should take this as evidence that the lockdown was the wrong thing to do or that the lockdown should have been absolutely a minimal putting our children at risk for long-term health problems. Um, so it, I hope that that doesn't happen, but um, I'm a scientist. Uh, my mm -hmm. job in this world is to put the word out there, do the studies as carefully as we can, interpret them as conservatively as we can, and then tell people what we think they mean and hope that they don't twist it. Professor Kuhl, thank you for coming on the program. You're welcome. Patricia Kuhl is co-director of the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences at the University of Washington.